Moderated by Bonnie Shaw. She's doing incredible work in our community as well as at iStrategy Labs. And Bonnie, would you lead us now about inclusive design through data sponsored by Yeah, so we're going to keep this pretty informal this morning. Um, but uh, welcome everybody, thanks for coming out super early. Um, it's, it's going to be a really exciting day and uh, really happy to have everyone here this morning. Um, my name is Bonnie Shaw, I'm the Director of Social Innovation for iStrategy Labs um, and we've been working really hard to put on DC Week for everyone uh, and really excited to start this day off right uh, with an absolute rock star panel of um, people working in social data. Um, so I am joined by really amazing people. Uh, on my right here is Andy Rossmeisel. Uh, Andy's the co-founder of Brighter Ladies Planet. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to DC Week. Get excited, <laughs> get ready to go to your first session. If you're not walking to one already, please start now. Ask anybody for help. Use found DC Week as your hashtag, and we'll see you soon. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, all right, so uh, we are we're running early now. Yeah, that's it's good. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so Andy, Brighter Planet, uh, co-founder and uh, sponsor of this panel today, which is awesome uh, and has made it possible to bring this group of people together. Um, on my right again, we have Tarek Koka. Um, and Tarek is the Open Data Evangelist for the World Bank, um, doing amazing stuff all around the world with their data. Uh, on my left is John Reinhardt, who is the Director, Program Manager for City Forward at IBM, um, also doing amazing work around social data in cities. And then on my far left is Andreas Weigand, who has joined us from Stanford, where he runs the Data Lab, and is the Ex chief engineer of Amazon. Scientist. 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 Sorry. Um, and so I'm just going to hand over to these guys to give a quick introduction to themselves. They're all wildly interesting and exciting. Uh, and then we're just going to have a big uh, friendly chat. So um, please get your questions ready. This is going to be a really open conversation. So uh, I'm going to hand over to Andy. Do we need you? Should we? If you, not if you know. Um, so yeah, I'm uh, Andy Ross Weissel, uh, one of the founders of Brighter Planet, and we um, we look at a really big issue, what like a big little one, I guess, um, a really big issue, which is climate change, and we provide basically an API for doing real-time environmental impact quantification. So we're trying to enable a new generation of applications from developers who may not be scientists, but who want to work environmental science into their applications. Um, and the title of this panel is Inclusive Design, and uh, really just interested in discussing with my panelists here um, how uh, you know the availability and, and, and amount of data these days is going to empower individuals to act on climate change in a way that previously only big corporations and governments could afford that data, uh, both with money and time, to, to do. And so that's what we're looking forward to. Hello. Um, I'm Taryn Koka. Ordinarily I can project, but I had a bit of a late night, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to try. Um, so I'm, I'm with the World Bank, and we kind of say we're open in three ways. We're open about what we know, so our uh, development economic data, stuff like GDP and population of countries, we're open about that. Uh, we're open about what we do, so our operations, where we put money, where we support yeah, kind of initiatives, and then we're, um, we're now supporting other people to be open. So other countries, governments, and institutions, they kind of come to us as a, how did you do it, or we'll give you a hand doing it. Uh, and I suppose the questions on my mind are in the public sector and in the development sector where I work, the sort of three questions that we want to ask of data are, one, what's the problem? Uh, two, what's the response to the problem? And three, what's the performance of the response? So once you've got information on those three, 
uh, big areas, uh, and it gets pretty complicated in international development. You can start doing interesting things. So I like to see how the interesting things we do can make with interesting things. So Excellent. And you may notice a common theme here in addition to the data, which is uh, pink. And uh, everyone, everyone on the panel um, has turned up wearing something. It's up to you to work out what they are. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is John Reinhardt, and I'm an urban planner and urban designer by training. And I'm really interested in the ways that um, data and the proliferation of data really impact the design of cities. Um, and so um, IBM is now looking at, uh, hired the first urban planner, which is really a, an interesting step for IBM, looking at the ways that um, organizations like Andes or Tarx are really pushing um, citizens to change the profession of planning. So there's a sense right now um, that you know individual empowerment and uh, all this tech and data is really changing where the planning profession is going. So that, that's really an interesting question for me, as well as data literacy. Um, how do we uh, inform people how to manipulate, use, and understand data? Because that's going to be just as important as um, regular literacy, I think, as we move forward towards 2020, which is a good point to pass off to you, Andres. Good morning, my name is Andreas Weigand, and two days ago I spoke in New York at the United Nations for the first World Social Data Day. And we now actually have predictions, which release one prediction a month at, at Predictions 2020. These are predictions for the year 2020. My group at Stanford, the Social Data Lab, is coming up with. The first one is I'll show you mine if you show me yours, which is about symmetry of data, that when we design things, it used to be that companies, governments, that design for data asymmetry use car dealers, uh, used to be the ones who actually catch the high profit margins. And our prediction is that in 2020, it will be those who design for data symmetry. Example, when you, for instance, call an airline, that not only do they know everything about you, because of course they know what your number is, for instance, when I call United, it's always, if this is not Andreas Weigel, or somebody calling on behalf of Andreas Weigel, please press whatever it is. But that you have the same symmetry that you know something about the other person, for instance, in the design, that they rate you after the call, but you also rate them. Like in Uber, not too many of you have cabs in DC? I, I never get one. <laughs> so in San Francisco, there's something called Uber, Uber German, or Addison Lee in London, where you actually rate the cabbie and the cabbie rates you. So now, it's all about designing things so people, institutions can make better decisions. And they ask, you know, if you were a cabbie and you have the choice to pick up that customer, five-star customer who actually tips well, versus the other one who out of the last seven rides, in it for four times in the car, what would you do? So I'm all for data, but it's not just sniffing the digital exhaust, but it's really creating incentives for people to actually give data, to create and share data to help people make better decisions. So that, that's a really great perspective to, to start with, I think, and um, everyone has really um, given it a good introduction. Um, one of the things that seems to be um, a really strong theme through all of this work is this idea of um, the development of collaborative ecosystems. So creating these platforms where people can create and share their data in interesting ways and then using that as you all say to help people make better decisions and to track the impacts of those. Does that make sense? Um, do you want to talk a little bit more around uh, the, the work that each of you do around how um, how those ecosystems are developing and how you're participating in them? Yeah, I mean, uh, we uh, started our work um, in part because uh, we basically were part of the grassroots climate change movement as college students. And um, there was just this tremendous, you know, community, passionate community of people who wanted to do as best they could. And a lot of them had different skills. and. Um, you know, what we found is that qualitative action by large communities like this is, is easy. You know, you can, everybody can want renewable energy and 
uh, you know, everybody can want to get a lot of people involved and to, you know, hit targets through politics and, and other ways. Um, but uh, we, it was really hard to get any quantitative work done. Uh, and the reason for that is because uh, climate science is pretty complicated stuff. Uh, and we were just kind of disappointed with the idea that in order to start to take sustainability to a quantitative level, that everybody who wanted to get involved would have to become a scientist. Um, it just wasn't feasible, and if you spent all your time becoming a scientist, then you wouldn't have time to learn how to be a programmer or uh, an organizer or anything else. So uh, we started to build this ecosystem, and I, this has happened in a lot of other places. It's not just climate change. Um, there's the mobile panel going on right next door. There's a company called Twilio there, and if anybody has ever tried to develop for um, you know, phone numbers and texting and stuff, it's like, uh, it's a black art. Uh, you know, you got to know so much about the telcos and everything. So Twilio is like, well, okay, we know a lot about that, so nobody else has to. Uh, they built a platform for texting and for phone calls. We're trying to do the same thing, thing for climate, and the result is that, uh, you know, people can um, work really hard climate science into their applications without knowing how it really works. Um, and I think there's, you know, going to be a lot more emerging examples of that with, with everybody here. Um, all of our fields, and so it's, it's exciting uh, to have more people involved, include more people. Uh, do you actually think that, uh, for instance, making a decision on the flight, and you knew the carbon footprint of that flight was another one, uh, do you actually think that there's evidence that people would make a different decision if they knew, and for the moment let's assume that the price is identical, mm -hmm. if they knew that there was a difference, or do you think that, no, just talk about it when it comes to it. And hey, if it's you know, if I get frequent flyer points in the air and I can't walk for, forget about the problem. It's a good question. I mean, that's the same question we had a couple years ago, and um, we we don't know one because nobody else, nobody uh, at that point in time, we didn't know because this information is just super hard to retrieve. Uh, you know, you you as you say, you look at a bunch of different flights, some of them have the same price. There is some difference in environmental impact, but completely, it's asymmetric, as, as you were saying earlier. And uh, so we developed some software to make this visible called CarePlane, and you know we have some anecdotal evidence so far that these are the actions, these are the types of actions that uh, folks are willing to make when it's not a cost issue, it's not a time issue, it's literally just a bunch of equivalent options with one difference in environmental impact. But we're excited to see, you know, as this information becomes more visible and more available, we're excited to see if providing information does actually lead to a behavior change. And the other question I had in that one is, do you think that how you visualize the information, how you actually explain to people what the difference is, whether you take, in this case, that side versus the other side? I mean, nobody really had the feeling of how Do you think a lot about what you do with the data in order to influence how you would make it clear to people what the effect really is as opposed to the number? Right. Well, we're, we're uh, that's actually not our specialty. Uh, so that's why we built the platform, not a bunch of applications. But we, we do have some visualization we're using. We are seeing that, you know, for example, we didn't at first color code our uh, little, little footprints that showed up on all the different flights. We just displayed a number of pounds. Um, and when we started to color code, it started to ring, ring a, a bell for people. So green, you know, it gets greener as it gets greener, redder, going the other direction. It seems to help to some extent. And Tarek, with your work, you talk about the problem response performance. Um, are you seeing some real impacts on being able to visualize that data and around the world? Kind of. It, I mean, for the, for the bank, it's still very early days. I mean, to put it into context, back in April 2010, when the bank launched the our sort of open data initiative, prior to that, we sold data. Um, so we, we, in effect, sort of collided three communities together. One was the bank's traditional community, our clients, who are governments to whom we lend. Um, and the, the other community were ac academics and researchers who purchased uh, licenses to read data sets on global economies and stuff, and stuff like that. So uh, these two guys suddenly became uh, bigger users because all of our data was free. And then you had this new audience of people from the, the world of open data. I presume everyone's heard of this term. Um, and there's a much broader global community around open data, open government data. 
Um, so we now realize that we have more users interested in our data than clients. Um, a third of all traffic to the World Bank's web properties comes because of data. Um, so there's more people accessing the World Bank for data than for any other reason, which is kind of astounding in itself. But like, it, it is still very early days. I mean, while we have information on these three areas, um, having information is very different to using that information to change the way you behave and work. Um, and that's not a problem for an individual institution like the bank to figure out. It's a, it's a, it's a wicked problem, as you know, plan, planners have, have coined the term back in the 70s. It's a complex, interdependent problem that requires many different actors to change their behavior in response to this um, information. So still, but early days, no. <laughs> And you, Johnny, you sing, I know you're doing a, a bunch of similar kind of mapping around favorite cities. Sure. Um, you know, I think the City Forward platform and also the, the entire IBM Smarter Cities uh, campaign is a recognition that the city is, is kind of the structuring um, place as we move forward. You know, we know 50% of the world's urbanized, 7 billion people. By 2050, 90% you know, of the world will be urbanized. So we're looking at ways to um, get people involved in that process of, um, of building cities and, and building smarter cities. So, um, for example, uh, the City Forward platform allows you to uh, visualize data. There's a recognition that, um, you know, smarter cities, and, and this could be a very technocratic planning process, but I think this time it's different. There's also recognition that you need the social input, you need the input of people, you need the input of designers. And so um, the platform that I'm working with lets individuals connect with each other, lets organizations connect with each other, um, through social media, you can share your explorations, you can share things. Um, so there's this, this recognition that it's not just about the, what the data says, it's also about the input that people bring to it and the input that designers bring to it. So Andres, you started to talk about the data exhaust. Do you want to, is that a term that people are familiar with here? <coughs> you want to give a little background on that and kind of talk about the center of your sharing your personal data and how that, how that happens with the exhaust. So we use the term digital exhaust, or data exhaust, for the traces people live, people leave wherever they go. For instance, you know, your mobile phone is a wonderful example that is actually a proxy for you. And with geolocation, it actually is even for me, who has put his schedule up on Viking.com since 94. It even scary for me when look the back Google attitude and realized that they backed out every single flight that took in the last few months because you know there are not that many planes leaving from say Rio to London. So that's actually interesting. But what I wanted to do first was respond to what he said, if you don't mind. Um, so um, one of the great things about cities is that geolocation is very natural to them. And the story when I teach is the story of John Snow with cholera, is it cholera? Oh. The, uh, cholera uh, the, the disease in London, where he, 150 years ago, plotted out on a map of the city where people lived that passed away dying of cholera. And then he managed to trace it back to the Broad Street pump, one specific pump which was infected. Now I ask you, what would have happened with that insight? If we had posted a sign there, please do not drink the water, the answer is nothing. So the only way he made the impact was to take off the handle, the pump handle, that pump handle. So my question is always that when people talk about insights, what is the action you're taking? And if there is no action, you might as well just forget about it. So I think many of those insights which we talk about here, if they don't move into action, we already talked about the taxi problem here in DC, uh, then I think we are just not going far enough. What I really would like to talk about is what many companies, many government organizations, I said I was just a few internets ago, um, move in the front as these are technological problems are actually not technological problems anymore. They're societal problems or societal decisions we need to make. So I invite all of you that when the next time somebody comes, whether it's a company, whether it's an NGO, whether it's a government, whatever, 
and tell you that something is difficult to really drill down and understand why they think it's difficult and whether that reason they give really is the reason. Example is, I'm a big fan of coming up with good metrics and I think companies are super well advised to deeply think through the equations of their business. Because when they do that, they realize that in often many cases, terms that they still worship have disappeared. And other terms that they thought are not important have now become important terms, such as the cost of interrupt. If somebody interrupts you, it used to be super cheap compared to the cost they had to pay to get the interrupt out to you. But by now, the cost of interrupt often is higher than the cost of causing interrupt. So that's relatively abstract. What I want to say is, let's think about what measurements we have and how we put those together into equations which we optimize in order to change behavior. That applies to cities, carbon, pretty much yeah, to our lives. Just to respond to that, I think, um, you know, from my experience looking at cities, they're no longer looking at just the insights for insight's sake. There's pressures that are being applied to cities, such as financial pressures. So they want these insights so that they can um, better use their limited resources. As, as the cities are getting squeezed, it's, uh, you know, for example, I did some work in Syracuse, and they were looking at, they said we have X amount of dollars, which is much less than we had before. How could we use data and insight to better um, work with our citizens to better apply that data, uh, better apply that those resources. So I think it's just not insight for insight's sake anymore. It's, yeah. There's other factors. For sure. Let me give you an example. Parking, since we're done with the taxis now. Parking, uh, San Francisco has data theft, or, uh, org, I think, uh, opening up this data. Very, very good project. Jane Nath's project, an amazing project. Now, if you know there is one parking spot in a one mile radius to where we are right now. What should the city do? Auction it off to some rich dude who is happy to pop down 500 bucks so he can, you know, park in fat, his fat ass car. <laughs> or should we have, and the estimate is that now 30% of all the traffic are people looking for parking spots. So it's an example of the technology is there. In San Francisco, park is there. All the meters actually know where their car is sitting there. They are essentially look. But what decisions do we make as citizens? If I know it ahead of time, then I can make a decision at home whether I take my car or whether I take Munich, the subway. But if I don't know that beforehand, then you know how can we help people with this? And what should we do? Should we charge a thousand bucks because that's what one person is willing to pay for it? Or should we let 200 people drive around the block in the hope that something will happen. That's what I'm talking about. I guess I'm interested in uh, sort of a logical extension of this and connecting back to what you were asking about earlier. And I guess what I'm trying to think about is, you know, there's, as we get more and more data, we can certainly help to guide actions and guide decisions. There's gonna be a certain point where there's enough that maybe you don't have to prompt people to make decisions, maybe you can make the decisions for them, right? And I think park, parking is a good example. A parking meter could know that there's only one spot and so it could raise, set, raise its own price up to $1,000 based on the sort of market dynamic. Is that where we eventually want to be or does that introduce complications? Should, you know, should the data only advise the policy makers or should they start to become policy? I mean, well, another angle on this is, um, are you guys familiar with the term of biomimicry, as in you know, you, uh, taking uh, a cue from how biological systems or natural systems do things and then trying to figure out how we can sort of copy them? Um, and you know, nature doesn't design things, you know, but contrary to what Rick Perry may tell you, um, <laughs> there's an evolutionary process and there is uh, data that provides feedback to the system and you get this notion of, sort of survival. So that, although the title of this panel is Data for Design, I kind of say, you probably don't want to be using data for design. You want to be using uh, data to build better feedback systems. Um, and the best feedback systems are the ones that you don't even know are there. Um, they're just happening automatically. My, my favorite one is you know, computer backups. Who the hell backs up their computer? No one, right? If it happens by itself, then it's going to happen. So investing in systems that automatically 
uh, cause feedback that change the system is where you want to be rather than uh, coming up with dashboards and things that policy makers can use to make decisions. Screw that. Automatic feedback based on data, that's where you want to go. One example that, sorry, do you mind if I jump in another example, but in climate, to bring it back to climate, you guys heard this new thermostat called Nest. Mm -hmm. So, who, like, who, you haven't? Okay, so here's how it works. So, everybody's seen programmable thermostats before, right? And, you know, when they came out, everybody's like, oh, we're going to save so much, you know, money on fuel and we're going to reduce carbon emissions by so much. But my parents have had a programmable thermostat for, I don't know, 15 years, and they literally have never probed at it once. It's, not, it's been on manual mode this whole time, right? I mean, that's pretty much what happens for a lot of people. But we, some folks, I forget, somebody started Twitter or something, or somebody remember? Um, I'm sorry? Former Apple. Oh, yeah, that's right, Apple guy. He said, well, okay, why don't we take this behavior that we see, which everybody just changes the thermostat manually, and we'll start to learn from it. Um, and so I think that's another example of, you know, so now this thermostat will, if you change it, you know, if you change it down every day at 7 a.m., and then you stop a couple weeks later, it'll, it'll just do it for you. Um, and I think that's sort of a good example of where we can head and like where we can start to actually make the decision. Take things out of dashboards and administrative interfaces and just make it natural. Sure. Those systems by their nature are designed, right? They, they're people making decisions about how humans will interact with them and uh, they'll respond to the data that they're programmed to. But there is an element of design that And so the challenge there is understanding how the uh, how you would respond to the performance. Yeah, so I mean, we're going back to those three things of you know, what's the problem, what's the uh, response to the problem, what's the performance of the response. We shouldn't try to be tackling those individual things. We should be trying to tackle the system in which those things operate. And that's the sort of design challenge and for, uh, for the public sector and international development. The, the, the hard problem is making institutions work differently rather than um, getting better data and feedback to individual elements of that uh, of that chain, which is why it's very hard. So ordinarily, when you have conversations about uh, data and policies for information, people are operating at the level of we need data to make decisions, whereas the people who are um, actually in a place to change the way institutions and governments work are not having these conversations, which is um, remarkably sort of frustrating. But I, I don't know what the right, um, how that's fixed. I mean, the, the old adage in academia is that um, uh, ideas only, only evolve when the last person who had the last big idea dies, right? So maybe we're just waiting for this current generation of government to, to snuff it until, <laughs> until and then other people come along. But maybe, maybe there's, a, there's a smaller way of thinking about it. So Tariq, uh, you said that people in those institutions like the World Bank don't have those conversations. It is like the Heideggerian hammer, which you are not aware that it's made of two parts. And you just use it perfectly actually until it breaks. Are they already beyond that stage? Is it sort of deeply ingrained in the way people live their lives in the World Bank? Or are they not even yet having the conversation because they haven't thought about it? Uh, I mean, certainly in, in institutions of international development, those conversations are happening. Um, I mean, at the end of November, there's a thing called the, the High Level Forum on Aid Effectiveness in, in, uh, in Korea. And the idea is that you're trying to discuss some of these problems. How do you make the aid sector work better? And some of these decisions are kind of being taken there. But it's still at the very um, high sort of abstract level, and it, it, the ideas are starting to come in, but they're, they're nowhere near the level I think they need to be at. Can I ask a question? What do people here think is the bottleneck towards actually using the data exactly? Is it that the data is available, is it is early, is it that the data is for political reasons, no, you know, I'm not sure if you mind because you're not sure if yours. Is it that people don't understand how to analyze stuff? Is it that people are worried that the data might be showing bad stuff? What is the reason that if anybody is not happy with the organization of people not using data to the extent they should be using? What do you think? Um, I, on a much smaller scale, there's a lot of what you are working in, um, I just find that people don't know what to ask for. That they don't even know what data is going to start looking for. And then, if you have to figure that out, I see that it's, uh, it, it, it's, I wish it was just analysis, but I don't think they know where to begin. Yeah. With what, what would be salient? I, I think that's important. I mean, we, and we find this in climate change, you know, a lot of people, when they're making a decision, they don't realize that their decision will have any effect on climate change. So, I mean, and it actually, that single 
decision can affect 100 different oil systems, but how, you know, how would they know which data to look for to like influence that decision if it's not just if that you know hasn't been done for them ahead of time? That's I think it's a big issue. Yeah, I, I mean for me, I, I'd say to some extent it's asking you know it's this question of asking what data you need, but really it's a question of data not being in the right places uh, or being you know being trapped in, in, in very closed formats. So uh, I think. If people, if data is just made available and, and made more contextual. So, you know, the example Andy gave of, you know, when you're choosing a flight, you know the environmental impact or, uh, you know, parking meters are, you know, the smartest, smarter, smarter than you are about where there's available parking. Uh, just making uh, data a bit more contextual to places where we make decisions. Uh, I've seen within large organizations people afraid that the data is going to decrease their freedom when it comes out and their share of the pie. All, yeah, freedom you say, or the power. To, to make decisions, the, the data is going to force decisions in a way that they will lose their power to make a decision and will lose their share of the pie, whether it's power, salary, or the price of privacy. That's the thing which started with cities and ended with people. Passport, you just 
you know, to call up uh, or if you use your phone, the words about it because you show your password, they know that's the phone you use. So how much do you want to be automatically? I think we have to have a goal because people understand the trade-offs. That's not black or white. That people make informed decisions on whether they want it or whether they don't. Most people actually don't even think. But the other thing is for me a goal to have people understand those trade-offs. Sorry, just to quickly hop back to you that leaves this question because I'm really just admit that this notion of data literacy. Um, so the, the two thoughts I, I had on that one were um, there's already a, a gap between people who have better data skills and people who don't have as good data skills and it's just now being uh, amplified if you like by the availability of more data and the, the kind of most annoying thing I see is people with data skills, I mean for ages people have talked about um, evidence based policy making right, um, you start to see now uh, policy based evidence making that the people who are in the position to make decisions will be also in a position to great data that sort of supports them. So that's one to keep an eye on. <laughs> um, and the, and, and, I suppose the other angle is um, data, data literacy is becoming uh, a sort of feature of the job market. I mean, you, you look at job listings with things like data scientists, or uh, I mean, now if the bank hires a statistician, you're not only expected to know how to use R and start an NSPSS, but you should know how to do basic data visualization and use web APIs and all this kind of stuff. So the, these skills are being built into job requirements. So I, I expect that, you know, I, I've not been to university in a while, but I expect universities are now probably teaching people how to do this stuff. So over time that gap's going to close, but in the meantime there is definitely this gap that we've got to really keep an eye on. Um, I have a good question for the panel. I really like that kind of dialogue about what the democracy of data and access, blah, blah. And maybe this is really cynical, but we live in a capitalist society, and I was just wondering whether you really think there's like a hope for real democratization of data because at the end of the world, like data is kind of stored, stored by someone who has a, a business and is kind of aggregated by somebody who wants to make money with it, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Like, is there like a, a hope for this democratization? Because I mean, even though I love to use open data and stuff, I don't really see like true democratization for you know like poor communities, minority communities, etc. I think the bottleneck is not the creation or the storing or the distribution of data. The bottleneck is the consumption of data. It's the final amount of attention which we have. So, in that sense, it's not proxy means of production. But, you know, no, no, it's just, I want to make sure it's really consumption what is the bottleneck. I mean, the thought I had for that is, I, I don't know. Um, I think all data is political work. If you're if you're someone pushing out data, you have an agenda, full stop. Um, because you're funded in a particular way to do that activity, and the data that you're putting out um, has a particular set of things about it. The only things you can really advocate for are one, um, transparency as to the provenance of your data. So at least you can tell what that is about reading, where does it come from, and what assumptions that you have in place when you put it out there. Um, and then two, having a slight bias towards public institutions publishing this kind of data rather than uh, non-public institutions, just because of the, the prospects for that kind of transparency are probably greater. Sure. Like, what if I said, like, oh, I don't want my electronic health record used or blah blah blah? <coughs> like, I could, I could say that, but I couldn't really make that happen, right? I like, that is, like those kind of things. Yeah, to take an, and exactly, and that, that these are exactly the sorts of problems that people are already now uh, kind of dealing with. When a friend of mine was complaining in uh, in Denmark or all the Netherlands about. about um, uh, and the energy surveys for households. So if you've got to sell your house, we'll do this energy survey to see how efficient your, um, your, your house is. And of course, if your house is not very efficient, you don't want to broadcast this widely. But by law, these things go into a public database. So anyone can then see how efficient or inefficient your house is. And there's no mechanism to sort of redact that uh, information. So yeah, current, current burning question on many people's minds. Sure, the energy efficiency, I heard that in Singapore, if somebody actually has some evidence, I would love to know whether it's true. Of these stories and never know where they true. In Singapore, they did an experiment where, say, half of the households were just told what the energy consumption is, and the other half was told what uh, their neighbor's energy consumption is. Yeah. Sorry. And uh, apparently, that had more of an impact, right? uh, much more of an impact than 
what they had by um, instead by showing people that they can save some money. So the social pressure, but that might just be Singapore. No, no, that, that's happened in the US too. One of the sponsors of this event, O Power, did that exact thing and yeah, found the exact same results. Oh, really? Where was yeah. that? Robbie, what's the statistic on that? Remember? Uh, I want to say like 70%. Yeah, yeah, not sure. Very high, significant. Where, where was that experiment done? Was it in Arizona? There's one in Arizona and one I think in South California. Yeah, I, I thought it was uh, in the New York metro area, the utility, working with utility providers there, but not, I don't, don't know. They're, out, they're outside, you can ask them. Yeah, they should. Yeah. So I know uh, one of the things we asked the panelists to do is to have a question for each other. Did he have? Yeah, thank you. South Sudan, which kind of popped on the globe back in June, we have eight data points for the country of South Sudan because it's not been around for that long and they're not doing that much in the way of statistics. All eight of those data points were queried by the government of South Sudan saying, hey, we're not sure you got this number right or we, we want to do this in, in, in a different way. And they can only query that because we publish the sort of metadata and the methods and the, the, the ways that, um, that we kind of do it. And, but that's for a very specific data with very specific audience. But they're absolutely right. When it comes to um, ad hoc data sets, so things that just sort of emerge without metadata, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're very difficult to interpret it, um, and use. And it, it's only the case in a few subject areas that you've got good standards for metadata and good practices for metadata. But generally speaking, there are quite poor um, standards and practices around metadata. So it's, a, it's definitely a, a problem. Here, here's, here's my reaction to that. Is, you know, we had a question about data literacy, and I think the more raw and the more complex and the more uh, decorated the data is, the more literacy you need to interpret it. And so I wonder if there are times where um, sort of simpler data that maybe isn't as well described is, is better, um, you know, because it requires less literacy. Uh, you know, we, in a, going back to the airplane example, we could provide a whole lot of metadata around that, but ultimately, Maybe the thing we really need to be doing is just like a thumbs up or a thumbs down, you know? And so, I don't know, that's a that's stand, standing question for me. I don't know if any of the other panelists want to weigh in. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of cities, uh, especially the ones that uh, have the data and they have the data open, the problem is not having that data, it's what we do with it. And so, um, some cities are trying to push this literacy by um, talking about data visualizations in the, in the physical space. So, for example, Helsinki is. Uh, World Design Capital 2012, and they're looking at what are some simple, effective ways that we can tell people about uh, their energy use, or we can tell people about how much pollution they're creating. So they're starting to think about simplifying this so that it actually becomes meaningful to people in, in a very kind of um, tangible way. Uh, so I, I think, you know, a lot of times, as Andre says, it's not just the data is there. It's, that's not the problem. It's how do you impact people to kind of interact with it and understand it. The time scale really almost has changed. Let me give you an example here of the recent E. coli outbreak in Germany. So uh, there are ways how the health officials report and they have long labs involved in observation and reporting of those. And as a result, millions of cucumbers were held hostage in Spain. <laughs> Instead, by simply looking at publicly available news data, tweets, etc., 
it would have been able to totally nail down that it was not the cucumbers from Spain, but something local in northern Germany. So here's one example where the traditional structure of reporting data and making decisions were just totally obfuscated by if people just look at what do people anyways share with the world that they have a pair falling out or a teeth falling out or a tense or whatever the effect of the So one of the things that I'm hearing is, 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 is that the Maybe we can do it on the mic. Um, suddenly when people are talking from the audience here, the things, the things that I started hearing coming out were power, context, connection, privacy, literacy, all these things Understanding the complexities of how different entities, different organizations, and communities need to interact, um, it seems like that's a really great place to kind of use as a, a petri dish or an experiment so that we can bring all these different things together and experience and understand how these relationships go. What's the kind of biggest impact you are seeing happening with uh, releasing the data that you're doing? I think the biggest uh, I think the biggest thing that's happening is that these organizations, and it was alluded to in the audience, these organizations that are collecting data about the same things and the same um, you know same parcel of land, same house. The fire department collects data, the water department collects data. All these uh, agencies that have collected data traditionally are now starting to realize that they're part of the same system, and that um, you can really see uh, the power of having, you know, collecting a full picture of the data. Cities are starting to understand. Well, if we talk to each other and we share data, and you know, maybe maybe we put it in the cloud so that all these data points about the same area are talking, we can make much better, much richer decisions based on um, that sharing of data. So this is starting to happen. I think um, you know, as Andreas mentioned, it's definitely not a technology problem. It's it's a policy problem. It's a um, there's territorialism in cities, and cities some some agencies don't want to release their data because they'll be embarrassed by how um, how messy it is or how sloppily they've been collecting it. We've seen that. Um, so I think as we, uh, I, I bring it back to education. If agencies and the decision makers understand the importance of collecting data, collecting data the same way across the city, um, releasing that data, then I think we'll start to see um, in the next 10 to 20 years some really interesting city making uh, things come out of that. Now, questions. We each each panelist, I gave them a, a job. Uh, they had to think of a question for someone else in the panel. So uh, it's time. We've got a few minutes left. I know we have to we have to finish on time so that uh, Andy can make a train. But uh, let's uh, let's run through. What do you got? Well, my question was for John. Um, just both, but I guess I think. Sure. So we were talking. We were chatting before the panel, and I naively assumed that. You know, because he's working with data in urban planning, and before IBM, we didn't use data in urban planning. So that was uh, not true. I guess we've been using data forever in urban planning, census and things. And so I just continue that conversation. I'd love to hear sort of, is it, you know, what, what's new about what you're doing and sort of what, what, what sort of new grounds are we breaking with that? Yeah, and I think the interesting thing about where we are as a planning profession is that we're starting to. Uh, interact more with other professions. So we're starting to talk to environmental scientists more. We're starting to interact with engineers and technologists. Um, there's a group that's formed called the Urban Systems Collaborative. So that has representatives from nine different disciplines. Whereas before, everybody kind of did their city-making um, role within their own silo. So somebody would rip up the street and put the electricity in, and somebody would, you know, and an engineer may understand their profession, but not really understand how that would affect the planning and the social issues. So we're starting to see um, converging around technology and the availability of this data that um, professions are starting to talk to each other. I think that'll have a huge impact for city making as we uh, move forward. Do you have a question for I did, and we also kind of touched on this, but um, you know, I'm very, very interested in this idea of data literacy, and I don't think we can really move forward unless people um, of all races, all classes uh, understand 
had a work with this data. So what is the responsibility of an organization like the World Bank to not just put the data out there, but take the next step to help people understand it and use it? Yeah, well, I mean, we're kind of seeing our, uh, our roles in expanding initially. You just think of yourself as a data publisher, but then you realize you, know, you can't publish data into a, into a vacuum. So um, for institutions like the bank, the level at which we have to operate is, is a bit different to where you, where, where you might really see uh, a lot of the action. So what, one thing we're doing is supporting uh, the idea of data journalism, so you can help to convene um, kind of sessions of training or handbooks or guidance written for journalists in particular because they have a, a pretty important net effect, particularly in developing countries. I mean, the, um, the primary means of communication in rural Kenya, it's not mobile phone, it's the radio, right? You can, you can get more information by that thing than you can by 140 character SMSs updating you on the state of whatever. Um, so uh, having that connection is, is sort of important. But I, I'm also kind of conscious that the inverted commerce market will sort of sort this out um, in, in a bit of time. So that's my, my take on that. And my, my question was, was for you, which was um, particularly on, on the subject of climate stuff, but also more generally, um, when people talk about using data to drive individual actions, for example, climate responsible decisions, everyone talks about uh, if everyone makes a small change, then the net result will be a big change, right? In reality, no, if you do the math, if everyone does a small change, the net result is a small change on a larger scale. Um, so the idea is how do you reconcile the emphasis on doing small individual actions with the requirement for a much bigger collective result? Does that make sense? Right, right. Uh, so um, my response to that is I just somewhat disagree with it. Um, yeah, <laughs> but that's why we're on panel, right? We're on the, um, so I, you know, I think a lot of the really big actions have become almost untenable, just political issues and um, you know capital markets and things. Um, we we think that the, the, the frustration you're you're sort of feeling with sort of individual action approach is because it's uh, it's so disaggregated, it's so hard to quantify, it's so hard to measure, and ultimately, in, in many cases, it's sort of uninformed. Uh, you know, I think everybody wants to think that, you know, the small, the individual action of driving somewhere instead of flying somewhere <laughs> is gonna, is gonna uh, sort of equate to this really big change for the climate. But in reality, sometimes you should actually be flying, right? It's just, it's, you know, it's this, uh, it's, there's, there's sort of rules of thumb that have gotten in the way of a lot of, of you know, just sort of these individual actions actually aggravating. And I think we have enough data now where rules of thumb are almost not needed anymore um, because we can make individual computations every single time. So we just, our company just did some research um, earlier this year about flying in particular because there's so many variables in flying. And, you know, there are some rules of thumb, you know, fly nonstop, and those continue to be important. But what we found is that that's pretty much it. Like, you can't say always take JetBlue. You know, you can't say, you know, always take smaller airplanes that are, or bigger airplanes. That you literally, you know, in order to make these decisions properly, in order for your individual action to actually matter, um, you actually have to, you have to be way better informed. Um, there's no rules of thumb. Uh, and so, I think that's really what's been getting in the way, and I think now we have the software and data to actually overcome that, that challenge. Because, uh, you know, we all want to be included in this process, right? I mean, individual action should matter. We have to figure out ways to make it matter. That's our, that's our job. Yeah. It also seems to me that those small actions might be an important area of consideration of thoughtfulness, conversation that they haven't been in before, and that might then lead to a political and social view of larger actions. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that, that's the symmetry thing. If we can get there, that's great. I mean, if, if there's some way to broadcast that people are making things, based on these input factors, then yeah, that should roll up if people are listening. Andres, did you have a question for the panel? I have a question for the panel. Where do you think you were totally wrong is something which you have said in year two years ago about social media, where this reality has been very different from what we thought. I started giving you one example I really thought that pseudonyms was the way to go with it. As we read the interview I gave like four or five years ago, and I couldn't believe just how wrong I was. Because it's all real names in society. So I would be curious where you might have had a simple experience that you were convinced about something and the world just went in a different direction. Yeah, I mean, 
I would say, I would think that agencies would begin to open up their data and start talking to each other as quickly as they are. Um, agencies are seeing some prime examples of cities like New York, Helsinki, and they, they want to be in those cities. So I, it really surprised me how quickly mayors and citizens and um, you know, nonprofit organizations have clawed up this idea that data is good, open data is good. Um, I don't know if we necessarily know what to do with it yet, and that's the next challenge, but it seems to be that's taken off much quicker than I would expect. Okay. We'll, we'll go through and we'll get into the end. We're about to wrap up. Uh, I, I guess um, my biggest being wrong thing was around um, sort of institutions' appetite for optimizing data delivery. So, I, I mean, I, I reckon that um, five or six years ago, people would be optimizing everything for. Um, you know, mo mobiles and low bandwidth type stuff just because we have lower bandwidth on these small devices and whatnot. In reality, um, the rate at which bandwidth has grown versus the rate at which the weight of content has grown is that they're not commensurate. You've got huge content um, still trying to be delivered to small devices. So that was my error. I just assumed that people would figure out that you need to make your content more consumable. But no, that's not, that's not happening. Um, I guess. Uh, Back in the dark ages of Brighter Planet, we sort of thought that the key, the key thing we can do for individuals is to uh, provide so much data about their car footprint and that you know, if only they would know their impact, they would they would totally change it. And this is, you know, sitting up at the panel now, obviously in retrospect, that's ridiculous, right? It's you know, that's just data for data's sake, and you know, what are you gonna do with that? And so, you know, we've learned that it's more about you know, informing individual decisions, um, and you know, who, who cares really what the, what the total footprint is at this point? All right. So for the final question for the group, um, we have just a couple minutes left. Following on from that question, I'm going to give you the chance to make a big bold statement that you can be proven wrong with next year. <coughs> Andre, you big stuff, sir. The three ingredients for building killer products are one, the product helps people make better decisions, two, the product helps people connect to each other, and three, the product makes it trivially easy for people to work. It makes it trivially easy for people to contribute. For instance, you know, you have a feature phone, you can text whatever you want to contribute of data or whatever it is to that product. So it's helping people connect is a very important one. Helping people make better decisions, better time for them, not for your organization or the company, and really make it trivially easy for people to actually contribute. That would be sort of like I would say, uh, and we may not be able to put this wrong next year, but you know, within five years, I think data uh, literacy will be incorporated into all kinds of curriculum, whether it be elementary school curriculum, high school curriculum, I think it's going to be an important skill. Um, I, I reckon by this time next year, then by this time next year, uh, more than half of governments in the world will have open government data initiatives and they will be uh, publishing useful public sector information that people will be using. We can measure that. Um, I think uh, this might not be a one-year time frame, I would hope so, but probably more like a five-year time frame like John's. But I actually think that in the near future, knowing the environmental impact of any activity is going to be just as easy as knowing a 